for you in Sonoria. And grazie for everybody to show up and enjoy the show and all the events. We make the show very great. We rehearse a cover song for you that we never played that in Italy before. It's from our favorite hardcore band from the past. This is Discharge, I look at you tomorrow! <laughs> With the horses. I well, see morbid corpses when I'm riding horses to the Morpheus. forest. With Morpheus. Dorfus, Dorfus fins with the Clorox <laughs> green. Dorsal fins. Dorsal. <laughs> you got dorsal, dorsal fins, fins like horses. in Harley Quinn. <laughs> I rubbed the lamp like, yo, what up, Jin? Because that's what oh, they call a genie. Oh, snap. Lamp. Oh, snap. Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, that's... See, folks, this is how good we are as, like, musicians. We, we're we not rappers, but it's... Like, we're so good, we could just... We could do it if we wanted to, but we, we don't could. want to. We could. We could. We could, we, we could and we don't want but to. But we, we just choose not to. I might want to, like, a little bit, but not enough to do it. Yeah, it's kind of a commitment, because it's, like... It's not just about, like, the act of rapping. It's about, right, like, it's like, the, the whole, personality. Like, an act, right? You gotta have an act to go with it. You gotta have... Can't, yeah, you gotta have a, have a shtick. You don't want to be just, like, some guy that raps. That sucks. You don't want to be no. Joey up the block. Ghost, ghost writing for someone who's got, like, a personality but can't write lyrics would be... I would love to do that. If you want me to do that for you, hit me up, because I will do it. Well, this is the Kings of Punk podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Tyler Hammer. With me are Jake Razor... And Gary U.S. Bombs. Hey. Greetings. And we just, uh, someone hit us up, said, yo, whoever on the pod mentioned Crazy Spirit being on Spotify deserves big ups. That's me. That hey. was you, and you do, because I, that was a good tip. I was just listening to them this weekend via Spotify. Yeah, I, I hope. Let's pump those numbers up, folks. Well, you know Get what Crazy it is. Crazy Spirit back. Crazy Spirit Revival 2023. Crazy Spirit fandom is dying. Like this comment to keep it alive. <laughs> one like equals one respect. You know what it is, though? People are probably like, Oh, Crazy Spirit, they would never be on Spotify. That's exactly what it is. I was like, why would they be on there? Yeah. yeah. Crazy Spirit are, are unofficial, official Turkish members. Or I'm just thinking about what those like Eastern Europe comments that or whatever that you told, showed us about like people being like, this guy is uh, Turkmenistani or something like that, you know? No, they're talking about John Cena being Albanian. Yes, that's what oh, it is. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Crazy yeah. Spirit is... They are from. <laughs> they are. Uh, the comment was uh, John Cena has said, I hate Serbia because he is Albanian, which isn't true. <laughs> and then, well, like a Serbian guy was like, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. <laughs> it's because John Cena, he liked, he like followed back an account on Twitter called like Albanians with swag or something. And people, and they were just like, that settles it. He's Albanian. Gotta proof. be. Gotta be. There, he recently followed a bunch of like bands. On, John Cena on Instagram yeah, what is like he, what Soul is he? Glow and stuff like that no which is like and like some him. labels it's like oh man John Cena I can point you to a much better taste well you know I what they're see, I could see him liking hardcore though yeah though I'm sure those labels are probably like Mr. Mr. Cena I can't see you but I will give you money even though we P can't see give you. us money please yeah he should sing in a hardcore band that would be cool he does have a rap album out yeah I'm sure it's good yeah, he, oh, we, really should, we should ghostwrite a hardcore album for John Cena. We should. You know what was a break I wanted? I remember Adam22 made an Instagram story post. It was like, yo, I'm trying to start a hardcore band. Like, hit me up if you want to play in it. And I definitely messaged him, him to try and do it. He didn't get back to me, I remember, remember uh, when, uh, um, what's his face? Uh, the rapper. Uh, John Cena? Not 2 Chains, though. He's white. In, uh, oh, Jackie Chain? 
Not no. Jackie Chan. No. The, oh, Bubba Sparks. Had, no. Oh, Marky no, no. Mark. More, more recent. More. He had the. Oh, Mac Miller. No, no. God damn. Oh, Eminem. Was, no. <laughs> um, he had the like Ravioli roller coaster. Rainfall oh, Riff Raff. Riff Raff. Yeah. He had a band. He was like, I need. The, I'm starting a band. Hit me up. Like that would be sweet. He that'd be. Good I don't for think him it too. turned out very good. I do. No, he I'm, makes like bad techno music now. I'm so. glad I was able to rattle off every possible white rapper I could think <laughs> yeah, of I think off that the top of my head. Pretty much every single one. It didn't really doesn't well, really go much. You're from missing there. like Lil White, and, and I didn't say Beastie and, Boys. Yeah. Lil White, Crow, I guess, Insane Clown Posse. Yeah, the entirety of insane of insane just, records. I guess it's just two guys in Insane Clown. Posse. Yeah, those two Not guys. Much of a posse, well, would you say? You huh? can't forget about Twisted, though. Oh, I was gonna say or Twista, but no, he's he's not. He's no, black. he's yeah. Well. Folks, this is a don't get it twisted with what we're talking about today because we are talking about punk because this is a punk rock podcast made by punks for white real rappers punks. <laughs> and white rappers, but very much white rappers, uh, you know, a dying breed. But like, yeah. we, a classic we still white rapper them. kid like who went to your high school who like, I mean, yes, the oxy epidemic eradicated like most of them unfortunately probably a solid like, three-fourths of them yeah and i'm not trying to be funny like i swear to god like that was like so no, many of those it's people. true like i remember sucks. i remember like cnn and new york times they kept talking about the wigger genocide and i assumed they were talking about that and they said china did it i don't really understand i guess that's where fentanyl's from but <laughs> why would china do that I don't know why they. Why would, would they? Why would, why they, would China <laughs> not want anything to do with Wiggers? She is just like, listen, I just find the freestyling like at the party with like <laughs> three blunts in, just so fucking annoying. I can't handle it anymore. <laughs> so, Jesus Christ! We are talking about. Uh, we're doing a big one, folks. Potentially one of one of the bigger episodes, I think, covering the legacy of Discharge. Q and music. Okay, here it goes. And this is a bit this like I said, it is a big one. Uh probably one of the more influential bands we've talked about uh have been around currently still existing in a form some form. Yeah. Probably and going on I mean what like 45, 45 years. years. Oh oh actually yeah, you're right. 45 years. 46 years actually now. Yeah, if it was cuz it's yeah. 77. Oh Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and in lowly Stoke, was it Stroke on Trent? Stoke on Stroke Trent. On Stoke Trent. on Trent. Stoke, Stoke on Trent. Stoke on Trent in the Midlands. Stroke yeah. on Trent. Not Stroke. <laughs> not Stroke on Trent. <laughs> don't not, Stroke on Trent. We're not stroking oh, a guy named Trent. <laughs> do not do that. But different episode. Do not do that. <laughs> yeah, we'll save that for the Nine Inch Nails episode. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Let's <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Nine inch. <laughs> what, what, how's Nine that inch. <laughs> and I cannot stress this enough. Nails. <laughs> What's the, is that? Is that Mike joke? No, that is a me joke, but oh. it's kind of in the style of Mike. But I like. I, uh, like I was trying to explain to him earlier, like that funny pop punk thing he he would do. Oh, dude. Yeah, we'll talk about that afterwards. Good when shit, the but. when the mics are off. Yeah, what if, yeah. What if discharge was pop punk? Oh yeah, we lo- we another ain't funny no thing. Ain't no feeble bastard, ain't no fucking scapegoat. <laughs> but I mean, you probably know who Discharge is, UK punk band, originators of the D beat, the Discharge beat, or and also Discore music, as it was called back in the day. Yeah, another one of those um, terms that went by the wayside. But yeah, that I it was we are taking. You know, I've been reading around, reading sources, finding information about this, which we talked about this a little bit on the Black Model episode. It is very hard to find, like, old info about, especially tours. It used to be a lot fucking easier, but the Internet's all fucked up now. Yeah, yeah. well, Google, like, they every- make it right. They yeah. deleted everything old. You have to go through archive.org for fucking anything other than, like, uh, something owned by a major news corporation or a motherfucker trying to sell you something. Um, yeah, disappointing. But, but I'm I'm glad we're doing this though, and I hope the algorithm is favorable towards us because this band, like I said, our listeners know who they are. I'm sure they're very familiar. But I think this band doesn't get enough credit for how influential they are. Given mm-hmm. like if we want to take a a pretense of like objectivity and try to be music critics, we're Rolling Fucking Stone, whatever. 
and we're looking at it like, well, whether or not this is to my taste, this is influential to such a degree it's worth talking about. I mean, ex- forget punk, like heavy music, extreme music, anything in that, f- anywhere in that fucking neighborhood is is completely different after this band does their full length records in the 80s even uh like pop music i mean what you got these music videos where you got lady gaga and chris brown wearing jackets with you know discharge yes, patches on and them that and goes back yeah i'll stud it up like the like the classic uh the album cover i like in those videos or like the, the like the punk jackets you can buy at the mall for people who aren't punks i like when they have like fake band band names on them like our, our friend kevin sent me a picture of one that said Rudy P on it. <laughs> Rudy P. Or or it was like part of the name Boy. rudimentary. It was P-Nai. like Rudy P. I I think. Rudy P. I it was, yeah. I all, oh man, I remember that um what's there was a YouTube there's a website YouTube channel for like tutorials and there's a classic punk tutorial oh, about the jackets. I, I know, remember what the one video something you're village. About. Um and the lady talking about the punk jacket and it's like a huge element of punk fashion involves customizing things and and working on things yourself. So, customized leather jackets are probably considered the primary punk piece of clothing, and this one is is no exception. Um, it's got the great leather lining, and the uh, leopard lining also in here. So both of those are are really big punk themes. And then you get into the customization has to do with different slogans. Now some slogans really like to be offensive. Um, you know, this one says negative on the sleeve, for example. But then again, even if they're negative, they tend to be countered because punks aren't really necessarily about anarchy. They're about challenging authority. And that's both when authority is positive and when authority is negative. So the other one said negative and this one said approach. The entire idea is for it to be contradictory and for it to be really customized. Another classic tutorial relevant here. Very good. One of the first things I thought of uh, trying to think about this episode in the film Another State of Mind, the documentary about the Social Distortion Youth Brigade Tour, the legendary uh, video of the skinhead guy teaching you how to slam dance, and he has the uh-huh. Discharge Three Skulls t-shirt on. Classic. And I was struck by that even as a teen, because I, I knew enough, because here in the present day scene in Rochester at the time, early 2000s, mid 2000s, like, there was a big divide between people who were into, you know, U.S. hardcore, maybe big divide is overstating it, but there were people into American hardcore shit, no way record shit, and then there were like spiky DB glue bag people. Like metal Not punk. a lot of like general overlap. No, and 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 a lot of oh, I don't like those bands. And to see that like a shaved head guy from L.A. in the '80s was rocking the Discharge Triple Skulls uh, reaffirmed my belief that this was like just one of the best punk bands ever, straight up. Yeah, they did way more than i like thought and i think they again it's one of those bands that like you said they have to be given their credits they have to be given their roses you know their flowers as some might say and and critics have gotten better with that in some ways like they'll give and maybe they have i don't know they'll give some credit to like thrash metal bands for influencing later heavy music whatever blah 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 but this band and and they'll talk about motorhead a bit sometimes probably not enough on them either given how influential they were but this band, it's like, I think in part because they created their own genre in D-Beat. They yeah. got put in a specific little corner, a little niche, and didn't get, haven't gotten enough recognition outside of that. I think they're also musically, as we said, they you know the genre of D-Beat is, is pretty much inspired 100% by them, I would say. But I think musically they are more deeper than that than people like you know usually attribute them to i'm not even talking about like the bad albums that we'll talk about later i'm talking about like even the like the singles and the records like the first lp like there's more kind of going on than one can think it's it's especially with the the first three singles it's there a lot of the songs don't have like a d beat like an actual d beat like as we know it now yes it's not there yet kind of it kind of evolves and you were, we were talking about it like when Tez becomes the drummer and they start doing these new songs they become like discharge ostensibly like they've they've always 
that like sound was always there from the beginning. Yeah, and a, and they do have a formula. They have a formula, maybe I would say a stricter formula than just about any band I could think of. Even stricter than the Ramones, I'm tempted to say. Uh, their songs all. I, we'll we'll get to the the content of the music later, but that is certainly something unique about this band and something that I think people who don't necessarily listen to hardcore punk could still appreciate. Not most people, but people who are into other weird shit. What comes to mind is uh, if you are a fan of like minimalist kraut rock stuff from the 70s, which uh, granted, I don't know how big that demographic is, but there is something similar but to me as a listener uh, between the work of Discharge and the work of a group like Can. Like you're talking about a band that embraced a sort of uh, austere... Um, akin to the Chimera Rouge's interpretation of Buddhism approach to music. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking about those guys in all black just thinking it was cool for people to not eat. Like, it's that kind of of approach to music. I think that could have appeal to, you know, people who appreciate all sorts of older avant-garde stuff. I think a lot of it, too, is that this band was constantly like doing stuff they were when they wrote some reading some of the book burning britain by ian glasper which talks about documents the 80 to 84 like uk um, punk scene um, minus a couple of things that he does know like he doesn't really talk about like peace punk or oi bands because as he said those are very different scenes yeah, yeah. um well i think he wrote a whole separate book for like peace punk yeah, anarcho bands too, and so. uh, and then he has the, I think he had the eighty five the yeah that's the trapped in the scene yeah the burning yeah. Britain book seems to document what was again there's a term people forgot about it was called in England at the time the new punk yeah because punk revival even um but with with a lot of these older records with discharge they like pumped them out quick they were like yeah. all right we spent two days to write these songs and let's do it you know versus nowadays. You know, bands rehearse for months and months, and then they do their, like, four they're, songs. They're two-song demo. They're two-song two demo. Yeah. So, and I, I do have, with the amount this band puts out, I do want to I have some things that, to say about that. But we'll, let's talk about Are the band's origins. good or bad things? Oh, no, I mean, good for them, but bad for, like, every band now. Um, this band started, formed in 1977. Yep. In uh, Stoke-on-Trent. Yep. This was the original lineup. It was... Tez on vocals, Rainey on bass, Bones on guitar, and Rainey had played guitar as well in 1977. Um, Nigel Bamford in 1977. Well, again, the early first year is very like, so there is a, first of all, there's a ton of lineup changes. Yeah. But even in the first year, there's already some lineup changes. Yeah. And then eventually we get Cal on vocals too. And then. Um, I don't know who plays drums early on. I forgot who plays drums early on, but someone plays drums. Um, but oh, Probably Ringo Starr at the was time. It Ringo, oh, was it Ringo Starr? Shoot. Okay. Damn, Ringo was really ahead of the time. Did, right, did you guys time. find anything on... I, I, I read an article on The Guardian that was about sort of both this band and GBH. I was trying to figure out, like, if Discharge, if any of those guys cited a specific gig as, like... Oh, I'm going to be a punk now. I, mm. I know for GBH, they who are from Birmingham, another area in the Midlands, uh, sort of the Rust Belt of the UK. They said, um, I think Colin from GBH said when he saw the Ramones, that was like he was like dropping out of school being a punk. I don't know if there's anything no, like that for Discharge. I didn't read I didn't anything in there. That. And uh, Tony Acko Atkinson was the drummer from '77 to '79. Yes, or so. I, I I read of his name as well, and uh, the, again the Guardian article which. Provided some more context for the formation of this band uh, in Stoke. I guess the punk scene in there was relatively thriving. Like a lot of punk bands from London would go play there. Clash, Pistols, everybody went there. Um, and the uh, the founder of Clay Records. What's his name? Mike Stone. Or Mike something? Stone. Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike Stone. Very important person. Very, very important. Yeah, with we'll, Discharge. We'll get him. Uh, yeah, he so he was a, a guy there who had been in the music industry a little bit you know, on a smaller level. He was not a punk by any stretch. He had been like a DJ and stuff, and he just he started seeing punk bands and liked it. He said it reminded him of seeing the Who in their like earlier days. Like it just it brought the energy back to music. And and in reading about old punk rock, you come across people like this. Even somebody like John Peel, where it's like. 
this person is not like a died in the wool to their bones like punk fan, but they can recognize what's valuable about it. Um, there was also a girl named. T- this is where I learned Echo's name. There was one female punk in Stoke. There were not a lot of punks one. there to begin with. There was one, one of them. And that she had blue hair or whatever, and that Echo guy ran up to her and was like, Oi, there's a female punk here in Stoke. Hey, I can't believe it. Oi, will you be wow. my wife? And she, he was with the other guys from Discharge. He was like, oh, by the way, we're a band. And this girl, I think Tanya Rich was her name, became a uh, became their manager, actually. It was pretty important to Discharge being able to get gigs and all that around England generally. And this is the time, you know, especially in the 70s, still needed a manager. A lot of people don't, you know, when they talk, when we, we've talked about it when the Sex Pills episode, people talk, well, they shell out all these they, and all they that. Not like, a manager. The Sex Pistols was existing within a fabric and a industry that required a lot of the things that, like, bands, even, like, three years later, three or four years later, didn't need necessarily. Yeah, and... Not and nearly as much. Not to go on a big tangent about it, but I think it's another one of those things, like we've said about how social media has quote unquote un- empowered artists to do their own publicity and stuff. Yeah. It's like, no, it has forced artists to do their own publicity. Same with management. Like we all know it cause we're all been in bands. I'm sure people listening do like it's fucking pain in the ass to try and write music and practice your instrument and have band practice and do the shit you do as a musician and also be dealing with getting merch made, getting gigs, getting contacts, doing marketing, all that kind of shit. Like I totally don't fucking blame anybody for not, I mean, aside from the fact that it was a given that you wouldn't do that back in the day, even yeah. punk, like, uh, I kind of wish you that it was still a little bit like that, because I would also love to be a manager for a band, but that's not really a job that exists anymore. But yeah, you ha- I mean, you could. It, it depends. It's it's not as easy and it's not the same thing. But yeah, right. being a manager would be kind of cool, I guess. Um, but the band put recorded a couple demos. And I don't know if they really played. You good, Tim? You yeah, falling I'm asleep? Good. Uh, their end really didn't do too much. I don't. Did they even play a show back then? I think they might have. Um, no, they they played they played gigs in Stoke at the at the very least. Yeah, I remember. Okay, I think in the book they mentioned like yeah, our first show there was like five to six hundred people or something like that. Yes, they did. Yeah, because of people there. again, that was punk was the thing. It, it was the thing that was in. So yeah. all, the, all the youth. It's all remarkable youth that the Tanya up. girl was like the only female punk they had met. Because in London there were female punks everywhere, but this yeah, again, this is in Stokey. Do you know what Stoke is like? Is it like a industrial city? It's, it's town? like I said. It's Midlands, to my understanding, as I've heard described. Any UK people who think anyone who's been to the UK and the US and thinks this is unfair comparison, please do tell me. But it sounds a bit like the Rust Belt of England. It was okay. like. The center of whatever manufacturing sector they had that got hollowed out a bit sounds Midland sounds a bit grim. Um, yeah. Why don't we? It's where heavy metal. I think it's fitting too. like. Yeah. Again, you have Discharge from Stoke, GBH from Birmingham. The two bands that really up the ante on punk being heavy, aggressive and stripped down in England. Uh, they were both from the Midlands, as were like the original heavy metal bands, Black Sabbath. I think Judas Priest, they weren't from london if i'm not mistaken I, th- I think judas priest is from birmingham as well yes yeah so it's an interesting lineage there that the the midlands seem to produce heavier uh more abrasive uh darker sounding mm-hmm. sounds in the uk that kind of makes sense you know yeah probably less people to go up against in a sense you can kind of do your own thing you can do your own thing and i mean halford's thing it's, maybe it sounds a little corny but i i, th- I think i totally get it i can't remember the I think Halford and, and some of the Black Sabbath guys might have said something similar, like just hearing the sound of like the factories when they were still running and, uh, you know, working in factories when they were younger. That sound like influenced them to make heavier music because I don't know, it's like that heavy clanging, that non-musical that um, crazy shit soundscape, which which I'm yeah. a fan of as well. But but certainly I, c- I could see. Especially hearing that as a kid, like it would do something to your fucking brain and make you want to. It makes sense. Let's play a song from the '77 demo. Yeah, this is Um, this is something. All right, we'll play "Sweet Suburban Dreams." It's a short one. Just.
So that was Sweet Suburban Dreams from the Discharge demo. Yeah. I remember those demos got reissued. I want to say like 2013, 2014, somewhere in there. Yeah. Right? And, and, and everybody told me, oh, it's cool. It sounds like the Sex Pistols. It doesn't sound like the Sex Pistols. His vocals sound l- remarkably like he's ripping off Johnny Rotten. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the music itself doesn't sound like the Sex Pistols at all. It sounds like... Uh, Wire's pink flag, but not on purpose. Uh, Wire was doing the minimalist thing deliberately and in, with intent. This sounds like they just are not very good at their instruments. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It, it's just, it sounds like that because they're not good. The guitar riffs, though, you can hear the the beginnings of Discharge, though. Like, they on some of these songs, he's Bone, Bones is playing, like, these plotting chromatic riffs that, like, after you've heard the later Discharge stuff, you, you can hear it and be like that sounds like baby bones riffs like that yeah. sounds like the the adolescent version of what would become discharge especially in contrast to some of the other bands that were like maybe sounded more like the ramones or were doing like a proto oi thing or whatever like those kind of chord progressions in those keys like were not in 77 super common that was not mm-hmm. th- usually the go-to for bands sometimes maybe a little bit but not to the extent that you can hear on the discharge demos that being said these are not I don't I've never like felt compelled to listen to these very much personally. I know some people love them. I, I think it's like I, I actually know about 77 punk. So if I want to hear something like this, there are so many better things. To, uh, right. I could go listen I, to. Not sure why you would listen to this charge. If, you know, you wanted to hear something like that. Yeah. yeah like the, it reminds me of uh, the Blitzkrieg Bop single from uh, that was a London band from around the same time period. The, I think Let's Go was the name of the single. I think like that one's better. These demos are clearly it's just like an interesting historical footnote. Oh, for sure. His vocals, I would say, remarkable. He even does the R rolling thing that Johnny Rotten does. Most people didn't go as far as to rip that off, but uh, he did. Uh, the shameless. They didn't shameless. Care. Completely shameless. It's funny. Well, that's what I think they mentioned in the book is that that it's like, oh, you guys, we don't really need like a Sex Pistols. You don't need a band that sounds like Sex Pistols in any way. I think yeah. that's why Taz eventually like left. I think that stopped doing vocals. I think pretty shortly Kanye after. and uh, the Clay Records guy. What was his name again? Mike My, Stone. Mike Stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He. I think they. He had gotten their demo and he saw some potential in them for whatever reason. And I would imagine those two sort of helped push them in the direction of trying to change something because they both seem to be pretty dedicated punk fans or like music fans. Yeah, but <clears throat> what we need to talk about really is the. The music that we know Discharge by, which is starting off with the first record, The Realities of War 7-Inch, which is Clay number one, I believe, too. Yes. The first Clay Records record. Now, at this point, Taz has joined on, has not joined, but moved over to drums. Cal is now on vocals. And Rainey is on bass. And I believe it's just, so it's Bones, Cal, Rainey and Taz. And Bones is also Taz's brother, by the way, for those that don't know. Um, and then the realities of War 7-inch, that's like... So in the book, it mentions that this record reached like pretty high up on the indie charts back then. Yeah, I think it was in the top 40 even. Something. It may be, maybe higher, maybe like the 20s or something like that. No, it's it was number 17. 17. I remember, yeah. That's pretty crazy for a band that hadn't done really much at all. Yes. They, and yeah. they, I would say at this point, like, they were, Discharge was, like, absolutely a big part of, like, the punk, what is called, like, the punk revival or something the, like the that. The new punk, yeah. The new punk. Like, punk was dead, you know, Crass said, punk's dead. Really? The, you know? The, yeah, the big three of the new punk, uh, I would say pretty clearly would be Discharge, GBH, and The Exploited. Exploited yeah. From uh, Stoke, Birmingham, and Edinburgh, respectively. Um, Interesting. No London, though. No, not not from London. London. I think London was probably they were probably a little up their own ass. I mean, yeah, it, I know it's it's like it very very different different parts of England. Even it was just remarkable because such a small country. But I mean, London. Yeah, you certainly had punks there, but they didn't produce a band like that. It was Vice Squad was a pretty big part of this new punk thing too that we often forget about, all because they didn't prove as influential musically. They, I want to say they're from London, but I don't remember because um, I don't know as yeah. much about Vice Squad. But uh, iconic album, Seven Inch, the Realities of War Comp or Comp Seven Inch. Um, it's got the Discharge jacket on the front. 
It's just the the spiked up jacket with the discharge logo on the bottom, which they took at their rehearsal space. Um, pretty, it's very stark, but I, th- it's like you see, you've seen this before. Yeah, I I want to start with the cover art actually because I yeah. want to pick apart why this became such a sensation. There's a few reasons I think. Absolutely got to start with the cover art. This is uh, first off the backstory on it. It was an accident. They were gonna have like a band photo, but Kale, the vocalist, did not want his photo taken. Uh-huh. So he turned his back to the camera, and there's your cover of the record. Yeah, which has now become completely I- iconic. Would really be the only word for it. This cover is a great, great, great piece of design and a great, 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 great piece of marketing. It's fucking genius marketing. It is a stark, memorable image in black and white, and it is showing you as the consumer something that looks really cool that you can do yourself too. The jacket looks cool. That could be your fucking jacket. All you need to do to have a jacket that looks that cool is become a fan of this band. Let's hear the record. Is it any good? Oh, it's fucking great. All right, I'm going to do that to my jacket, and I'm going to buy their next record. And I'm going to tell all my friends about this one because it fucking is a really good record. So from a graphic design slash marketing point of view, I, I, and it, to make it a thousand percent clear, I know these motherfuckers were not thinking about marketing, but much of the best marketing, I think, uh, can happen by accident. And sometimes, right. you know, like you said, you know, you don't probably don't they don't even think about it. Yeah, and it just happens. Yeah. And, and, it's organic. Yes, and 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 that was like that. I think had to have been a part of, especially if you think about the fact that in England, you know, famously, and they've been derided for this before. Like fashion was a big part of punk. Yep, and Huge. competing to to have the newest, most extreme punk fashion was a big part of it. So that's built into this cover art right off the yeah. right from the jump. And this also features a couple iconic things on top of that in the seven inch, um, the the face. With the Anarchy A? Yes. Where did they take that from? That was from, like, another record, right? That was, like, Xeroxed, you know, a dozen times or something like that. I haven't heard of that. Maybe. I've, yes, that's it's something like that. A magazine or I think it's some other kind of record. Like and a, a fan. Once you maybe? see it, and it's and I think it is a cover, and once you see it, it's like, oh, shit, that's what that is? What the fuck? And also it has the iconic, thanks to... No fucker. Oh Which, yeah, that's where the band. Okay. That's where No Fucker got their name from. Um, like ninety nine percent positive because obviously, yes, if you don't know, No Fucker is a band from upstate New York, uh, the Rome, beautiful Utica, town of Utica. And uh, I think if there was any D beat band post the eighties that I would like the two thousands bands that I would say are like absolutely crucial, No Fucker one of the best, hands yeah, down. Hey, if you get the No Fucker disc close split, like. That that oh, would man. that's like a desert island DB record. Game yeah. over. Both both of them too. Um, they have two. Yeah, so, absolutely. Reality of War, great record. Do we want to play a song off of it? Yeah, let's let's play a song and then and then we'll pick apart what's happening musically on this a little bit. Which which one do we want to play? There's four tracks. Uh, they declare it. I think is a good pick. They declare it. Yeah. Okay. I'll play the. We'll play. They declare it. <laughs> So, yeah, that's They Declare It from the 1980 Realities of War EP by Discharge. Um, so a couple things. A couple. So this the way I think of this record is like they have established their formula. It now sounds like Discharge. They're just executing it 
a little less efficiently than maybe they would later. So like on on the verses in this song, they're not playing the D beat. Um, the D beat is the drum beat that this band is credited with popularizing. And what is it like? It's the 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 kick is on like the one and and the two and something like that. That's like a D beat. One two one. Yeah, one two I... one two three one two one two three. It's yeah, a yeah, yeah. syncopated beat. Yeah, I was going to, that's the word you're going for. I mean, for. it originally, you know, people say it originated from Motorhead. Some people say it originated from, um, um, I read an article that talked about the YEP and they're like, they stole it from Motorhead. And it's like, well, very bold of you to say they stole a drum beat that really anyone could have come up with. Yes, this is the band that popularized <laughs> it, though. Yes, and, and, for sure. And, and, and um, you have Cal's vocals, which are sort of hard, how like jesus they're Christ, like double tracked yes which was mike from clay records his idea because he didn't really know anything about recording and he was like well this is what bands do yeah um and uh it, it which ironically that's like now i would associate that more with like rap music than anything else um, see i always associate with like the first carnivore out record that too that too um but but he like kel's vocals are harsh shouted not it it's like the lyrics are simple, so it has some degree of a sing along quality, but it's not like an oi thing. Um, pretty pretty stripped down musically, and and crucially, the lyrics are like these very simple anti war lyrics, like very heavily focused on that, which was something Crass was very focused on. I know Cal was a big Crass fan. It seems from reading in the book too, it was that was all Cal stuff. The anti war yeah. stuff was very much a Cal thing. Yeah, no, nobody else in this band seemed to care about that, but he was very focused on that. And, you know, people talk about different political issues in punk back then, but Discharge specifically seemed to have a really strong focus on anti-war stuff in addition to sort of anarchist stuff. Um, a little, I guess, for lack of a better term, less heavy than some of their later records. But like I said, the formula is there. Also, I will note the face with the anarchy A. That yeah. is, This is interesting. This is, I think, revealing that someone, perhaps Martin H., the mysterious man who designed all their 7-inch covers, more eclectic taste than just like straightforward hardcore punk that face is uh the lead vocalist it's from the first seven inch by the the pop group from 1979 it's the vocalist of pop the group face. the pop group yes the pop group uh they are not a pop group ironic name they are a very noisy and abrasive like experimental post-punk band very very good band recommended but not not like a ramalama uh, fucking drinking hooligan song like fun new punk band by any means no but this was a this was a big record you know I mean I'm t- trying to think of like stuff from 1980 like this early so and, like d- the others from the big three would be uh, I think exploited dead cities or army life whatever the first one was was 1980 and uh Believe, GBH GBH for sure I think Sick Boy was the first single and that would have been then um, Verukers was until a year later yep you had Vice Squad but that's not quite as hard as this that's a little bit poppier sounding or just a continuation of 77 punk I mean you have like in the US you kind of have like Black Flag oh you have stuff in the you US have, for um, sure how about Chaos My, UK Chaos UK yeah. was, or is that a little bit later that's 81 I think yeah okay Disorder's first record was 1980, wasn't it? Am I wrong about that? Mm, no, that was 81. Sure. No, that was all 81. Yeah, so not not a ton. This is again. So we all talk, me and Jake were talking about this, and I, I don't know if I brought it to you, Tim, but like the idea of dividing up genres into waves. So like we, we know for a fact there's, with, we just talked about with black models, the first wave, second wave, third wave. We kind of like see that. But people don't really talk about like that with hardcore really like almost at all like it's always just like classic you know old school hardcore which is like usually referenced from like 80 to 83 or 84 or something like that Mm -hmm. but as you brought up you really could kind of classify it if we wanted to do it similar to black metal from like 78 to like 80 because that's when a lot of like some of those bands started like black flag started in that time i mean fucking discharge did they're around from 77 technically yeah, I mean, ground, um, ground middle class. Yeah, and and the, an interesting um, parallel that I've always seen is that uh, in in the UK and in the US, like around that time, there again, if you want to, I'm not going to get too granular with the waves, but you have like an initial 
sort of explosion of punk bands in 77 that are following in a more sort of style more grounded in rock and roll. A lot of those people, a lot of those bands move on to post-punk, other yep. pop music, whatever the fuck they were doing. New wave and all that. Yes. And and in both cases, you have younger people who are still really enamored with this more aggressive style. And in, in the U.S., that leads pretty definitively to like early hardcore bands. Like uh, Teen Idols would be one yep. of the first ones to think of. Even sure. Bad Brains, Middle Class, uh, Black Flag, yes. Uh, in the U.K., it's a little more splintered. One, one way that manifests is the Oi movement, which was a very... It's stripped down in the way that bands like Discharge were, but it they didn't speed things up in the way that the Teen Idols would. Yeah, no, um, for sure. It's following more in the tradition of Sham 69 and shit, and that's associated with the skinhead movement in England, which by that point was because they have their... UK is, was has always been big on this youth tribe thing. So, like, by 79 or so, if you were a skinhead, you were not saying you were into punk or that you were a punk or anything of that sort. Uh, and then the new punk or hardcore punk like Discharge was the other direction that went in where it's both stripped down and sped up. And that, mm -hmm. that really does, now that I think about it, seem to be a Midlands phenomenon in, in origin. So pretty much um, the idea of, like, the Sex Pistols middle of the road, not necessarily just the Sex Pistols, like the middle of the road punk where it's, it's maybe a little more, it's a kind of a beat and stuff like that, but it has, like, solid... Maybe some solid production because I th I think like never mind the box is it sounds good it's very well produced um, yeah that kind of like goes away well yeah and, and crucially in in England especially you have the music press which is um, part of the British press which is a sort of unique uh, monster of tabloids and uh, sensationalist bullshit. Uh, constantly music press is talking by by seventy eight they're talking about how punk is dying punk is dead. Uh, fuck that, whatever. Uh, Gary Bushel, it sounds, the big uh, oi advocate who put together those oi comps, he he was sort of trying to champion new punk bands and oi bands, but, like, that is all over the headlines. You're hearing about how punk is dead. It's over, you know, if you're a punk there, you know people who are getting into ska or fucking teddy boy shit or whatever. Um, and uh, I, I think it was it was a big deal to people there to that, you know, Bands like this were sort of trying to keep carrying that torch. Whereas in the U.S., it's it's I feel like because you don't have a music press that's quite like ours here. Yeah, for sure. It and because they don't have this culture of like youth tribes and shit, where your identity is super bound up with the music you're into at this point and your fashion. Uh, it it would have been a bigger deal on a personal level if you were like over there maybe 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 not but it, it, it certainly was more it i just think it's interesting how it like they articulate the the way they articulate some of that stuff in the uk if you read old fanzines and shit it is like comes off kind of silly and very like adolescent but i guess it's just a different cultural thing i just i just think it's cool that like uh you have these sort of parallel phenomenons of like trying to continue the thread of 77 without veering off in a different direction but it looks and sounds a little different in the u.s versus in the uk oh yeah for sure and uh you know i i think tim i don't know if you maybe agree i think versus the u.s and uk i think the big difference is just like the u.s is so big yes it's true too someone on the west coast some on the east coast you know thousands of miles between them and you know you got midwest you got the south yeah you got the down south you, you got, got the north northwest West. you got canada no one says the north you got the north the north yeah <laughs> the north you got knowledge yeah old mom check them out but north yeah, got knowledge you got knowledge it's, it's, it's mississippi blues delta listen, blues listen, you got was, alligator ass i was in the hardcore back in the day they called me <laughs> They call me the they call me the six man because I would be watching that six. I would be no one no one was stole my gear before ever. No one ever stole broken my, my van. <laughs> no I one broke my into six. my van. <laughs> man, they slipping man. Do I but, think do I think Henry Rollins is a tough guy? No. Do I think Harley Flanagan's a tough guy? No. no. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think. Um, do I think HR is a tough guy? No. Do I think Stickman from Fury of Five is a tough guy? No. <laughs> We're doing Steven Seagal <laughs> for folks who don't know. These are all just absurd things Steven Seagal has said. But yeah, if we've he been was a Steven hardcore Seagal guy, kid. which would be awesome. Um, I wish he was. I wish. I wish. 
Yeah, man, I ain't, I've been moshing for this five years, man. Does John Joseph scare me? No. <laughs> he's like, he's like talking about like crowd killing or like circle pitting. He's like, yeah, I've had, had to use these techniques in the field many times. <laughs> You know, uh, I've been contracted by many top intelligence agencies to spin kick people many, many times. And do I think the guy from Harm's Way is tough? Can I laugh at you? <laughs> can, can I laugh at you? <laughs> yeah, I permission Who is he to saying laugh that about? Your... Some, <laughs> some like, te- like a, like a co host. Well, oh, no, it's TV Michael Jai White. Yeah, oh, I think okay. the, the, yeah, the interviewer's right. asking him about Michael Jai White and fucking John Claude Van Damme, and he's just like, Can I laugh, can I in laugh your face? at you? Can I laugh hilarious. in your face? Can I laugh in your face? Really? Yes. But, you know, that's interesting. We're talking about fighting. We are going to be next talking about the Fight Back EP. That's right. From Discharge, which came out in May I will of also note, in, in reading about the Midlands punk scene, one thing that uh, I think one of the guys from GBH noted, he did say lots of fights at the shows, but once the, like, he said that once they started getting bigger, it was at least from his view on stage, less bad. Um, but early on, like when Discharge and GBH started or started to have a bigger audience, a lot of people didn't really know what to do with them. Like it was too heavy. Mm. They didn't know what they were hearing. And uh, that doesn't really surprise me. We got a, this record I think is great. And I, I wanted to note, as I mentioned earlier about these, this early Discharge stuff. So the uh, Reality of War 7-inch comes out in, March of 1980. The Fight Back EP comes out in May of 1980. That's two records within the first half of a year. It's unheard of. Th- they have, and guess what, folks? It's not There's unheard of. It's unheard of single. now. It's unheard of now. Like the band that I think is the butt of a joke on the first Seven Inch Club is this band, that band Buggin from Chicago, who they have talked about and other people have talked about how they have it's like wait what, that's formerly bugging out formerly bugging out and how this band, this band is like consistently getting like write-ups and like articles and like you know but they have nothing out they have a demo which is like five songs then they have like a single which is like a song which has a cover on the bees the b-sides it's a bc boys cover and like they have like a maybe a split and then now on a new list that i saw it's like a uh, uh, here's another song that's on a comp. Didn't the article from the Grammys mention them? They did. They yeah. did. Yes, that's one of the bands. Which we didn't mention this. We you totally skipped over the fact that Zulu was on the list. Yeah, because I forgot about them because it's boring. Which that sums up about everything we have to say about that band. I know the only other thing I said about that <laughs> band off mic that I'll say again now is to, to me, and this is, and I mean this seriously, to my untrained ear. Because there's a lot of things within hardcore that I just skipped over because I got into what I liked, whatever. To me, a Zulu just sounds like a mirror. Yeah. No, they kind of do. You're they, not wrong. Like, like, it sounds like scene kid, like, screaming and then... Yeah, like metalcore. Like, they sound bad metalcore, yeah. more like a mirror than they do Discharge. Like, yeah. you could or, trace it to a mirror f- way faster than you could trace it to Discharge. Yeah, for like, sure. Or I'm, even... I mean, I also see people calling it, like, a power violence band. It's like... Yeah, yeah no. Yeah, I don't think so. Honestly, I think all the power violence stuff, a lot of the journalistic stuff, I, th- I think journals... Really need journals or not. You good. need the journalists. You need to take a step back. You're the reason why power violence got like watered down. You know, a lot of fucking genres. So, but my point is, is that like, if this was now, the realities of war EP would have been put out in 2021. Then this fight back, three of the songs would have been put out as like an EP in <laughs> 2022 Bandcamp. at the end of 2022. Yeah. yeah. And then the other two songs would be divided onto comps for all of 2023. And, you know, they it just the, the amount of material that Discharge put out in such a short amount of time is like two bands nowadays is like unparalleled. Yeah, no, it is. It's insane. I'm not going to fault all the bands now for that because there's other factors. I mean, these guys, I think, weren't working at this point and presumably for one reason or another didn't have to. They could maybe get away with sort of uh, improvising on making a living, squatting, whatever they were doing. Probably getting their dole checks, too. Probably getting their dole checks. uh, Uh, 
And they had yeah. and they had Clay Records, which was a studio and a label. Yeah. Which nobody has. And now if you want to record your band, I'm trying to record with my band Eclectic Blend. I'm like, I'm just going to do it myself because yeah. it's fucking like, what else am I going to do? Pay $500 to go to a place that has never heard anything that sounds like this? I'm not doing that. No. I think I, you'll find a place. We'll find something. Yeah, but, I'll uh, figure it out. I kind of want to try it I, myself anyway. But That's yeah. why... That's why I think when my biggest gripe when I hear the one sided LP, the the you know the three song seven inch, the you know putting in the least amount of stuff. Like we, back then, it was cheap to put out records. It was yeah. relatively, it was you know you could put it out. They talk about how it's like, yep, we recorded it in three the first record in three hours. Then it was mastered, and pretty much the next day it was like sent out to like get pressed. I will say too, crazy that, sh- that shows they were practicing a lot because it is so much tighter than the other stuff. Like, yeah, it, they these guys. One thing I have always noticed with the band is like they could play. They're not a sloppy no, band. No, not necessarily. There is a funny live video where they get off. They like start playing and it's fine, and then like at one point they just get like they lose the time, and then for the next like two songs that's on the video. No one is like playing in time. It's <laughs> hilarious. It's ridiculous. Um, but like the fact that bands like you, yes, it's going like let's be honest. It's going to take nine months to put out this record. Nine to ten, nine to months to a year. Like you should be putting the most you can into it because it's like this is going to be take a while. I mean, and you've talked about this too. This could maybe this is the last thing we end up doing. Maybe something happens and we break up. Yeah, no, you know shit. what I mean. Like. To so I I just think it's it's frustrating when bands don't put out in either enough material in a short amount of time or enough material on a record that it's like yeah we know it's gonna I'm gonna pre order it and wait four more months to fucking get the record oh thanks like, I'm grumpy because you talked about uh, that bugging <laughs> band I bugging we talked about them off mic I don't want to make any more people angry so I'm not gonna say nothing well say why don't anything. we fight back with a little bit of fight back from fight back by discharge. By Fight Back. By Iron Maiden. This is our result of the possession to obsess now. Back to the back, back, back to the back, back. People Stand up, trust the freedom, stand up, trust the right, fuck just the fire back. Hit with the fight back, and uh, I think the the difference between this and the previous record is how like immediate it feels. It's faster, faster, markedly faster, heavier. Like the drums on this are sick. Um, Jesus Christ! <laughs> oh, Sorry, good something Lord. unrelated that is popping up. Yeah, here. we're losing focus, folks. I just t- told him it's a national Adderall shortage. Big trouble. Yeah, this is it's rough. But uh, I think I think this is still kind of like that. So when people think of discharge, and we'll get to it in a pretty pretty quickly. Uh, there, this is like the DB, like in that first and, song. And crucially, they do it the entire record, I believe. Yeah, pretty much. Like uh, relig- no, yeah, I think they do some variation of it the whole time. Um, yeah, like this, you take part in creating the system. Like great song, the, really the, fucking one of the definitive DB songs. Like there's yeah, this is a this is a really good record. It's, we learned to play that song. I, we, Shit. Did we? Without Cougar. The, all, the, all the rest of us learn to play You Pick Part in the Creating System. Damn. We should cover that. We should we cover should. it. Uh, this was notably, uh, to go back to a previous episode a couple of, a year ago, number one on the Pusshead list. Yes. Yes. And it was my favorite. I've had a few different favorite Discharge records since I started listening to them 
probably when I was like 15. Uh, first, it was why, because at the time, my understanding that I gleaned from the internet and whichever people I knew was, why is the best record? That's their fucking definitive record. Then I read that plus head list, and this became like, and I listened to all their stuff, and I decided that was my favorite, probably because he did. Uh, to this date, I would probably say, hear nothing, see nothing, say nothing, 12 inches, my favorite, but Fight Back is a second. I like that it is like, their formula executed like one step more clearly than you can hear on realities of war, but it doesn't have the big heavy guitar sound yet. I love that guitar sound, but it's very cool hearing this sort of bare bones. Like I describe it as a wiry sounding record. Like they're playing with this wiry guitar tone. It's kind of crackly fuzzy sounding, uh, but they're playing the music they would become known for, and and the songs are like some of their best. So I, I yeah. would put this in my top three for Discharge. Yeah, I definitely. Uh, out of the three, I think this one is probably my favorite. The control is uh, really fucking good too. D-Control's so I would not great. shame you for saying that's the best one. But yeah, why don't we talk about D Control? D Control, September nineteen eighty. So this, man, this is hard to pick a favorite because that shit is that the title track on D Control is one of the most like chilling, bracing yeah. punk songs I've ever heard. It gives me fucking goosebumps every the le- time. The lead on it, the wee, 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 that lead is so one sick. of the best. Yeah, like I, I think the lead Bones is like lead work, especially on these records are like so fucking sick. Uh, yeah, we might have talked like, about it when we talked on the Plus Head one, but uh, you take part in creating the system on Fight Back. That is maybe my favorite guitar solo ever. And that's yeah. it. That's all it is. That's all you need to fucking do for me. Yeah, and it's so it's again so simple, but they they follow the the kiss method. They do. I mean, they do. But like again, it's like just in a, it's it's immediate. It's in your face. It's it doesn't overstay its welcome like ever. Like, yeah, totally. Nothing to get bored by kiss method. That's another one of my favorite guitar players, Mr. Space Ace Freely. Yeah, I actually do. Oh, two, I thought you meant Paul. Two of my biggest influences. I I definitively do not mean Paul Stanley, but <laughs> um, all right. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, D Control. The title track. I mean, they play that same riff the whole time. Yeah, and that is they have a few. And that's song- kind of like the DB, but it's like a, it's like a on the toms. Yes. It's again. It's that. It's very driving, like. The Discharge is a driving band. That, and that like, song especially, and Kale is screaming louder and louder and more unhinged. I mean, that song just gives me a feeling of, like, the fucking clock is ticking in my head. And also, the clock is ticking for humanity. Like, the pot is about to boil over. I do have yeah. water that is about to start boiling. He's got but, the kettle on. But the, I feel that way anyway. The like, nuclear when drums. When I hear that song. The nu- yeah, these are the nuclear drums that uh, Sarcophaga was talking about. Yeah, it could be. I think, I think they are. I mean, if you... Decontrol, decontrol. We've been shit on for too long, but I think the that the ace, the the B side is kind of uh, my some of my favorite stuff too. Uh, it's no TV sketch. Now, if we're talking leaking head, it was old leaking head covered that. We yeah. covered that back back in the day, ten years ago, eleven years ago, eleven well, years ago. I wish ago. we could cover that again, man. I want to cover we, discharge. I've never ever covered this band. They've been one of my favorite bands for approximately one million we, years we could we should just do a discharge cover set one day that would be cool, it would yeah. be so easy to do like yeah dude yeah we, i would love to do a discharge cover seven inch one day yes oh i mean yeah well there'll be three three songs perfect three songs one side of it we're per, we're good and uh should we play let's play it's no tv sketch i think that kind of we can showcase the difference between that and the previous record or do you want to play D Control? I think we should play D Control. D Control. All right, let's go title track. It, it, it's an incredible song. All right, here we go, folks. D Control.
That was the D control, and you know I do think you the that was a good choice because how it ramps up at the end with his vocals is is very sick. It's, it's very so powerful, too. and and it like I and I I know this is probably not at all consciously what they were going for, but uh, wow, five oh. secret positions they like most. Every guys, man must know. We regret to inform you that we have YouTube <laughs> open in our living room now, and I'm. Penetration that, with with threes used, and fours. Yeah, there's. It's recommending us a video from a channel called The Power of Psychology, and there's a video telling you how to like fuck a girl, and it says what? five types of penetration every woman dreams of. Guys, but if you look to the left of that video, what what else do you see? M O D. That's what every woman wants. But penetration is spelled in lead speak, and only yeah. old people like me will know yeah. what that even Pen- means. Pen- like the the pen part two threes. And then the tration, you right, got a so four Tim, for that. Tim, a. bookmark that, please. Yeah. But uh, save it. We have so, some research later. Yeah, we're, we we're gonna be watching this fogging video uh, when the mics go off. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the the D control single, I, again, I don't don't think it's consciously what they were going for. But one thing I like to do is it's it means a little woo woo, but it's kind of like in the musical collective unconscious. Like there's threads you can hear. Outside of what people are constantly going for. Like, to me, like, because you can hear there's two guitar tracks. And at one point, Bones is, like, playing lead on both. But one of them yeah. is fucking up a little. And it sounds off. so frantic. And it sounds like the whole thing's falling apart. And it reminds me of, like, the best of, like, free jazz stuff. Like, that's uh, one of the only places, like, the way it makes me feel is how I feel when I hear that. And there's only so many things that make me feel that way. Like, it Discharge... Some of their songs do that, and yeah. uh, the, them playing this sort of ominous riff the entire time with this driving drum beat—it actually even harkens back to like Black Sabbath for me spiritually. Like uh, a fellow Midlands band, like those Sabbath songs where they're playing just one heavy riff for a very long time, and it's just so ominous and so foreboding. This is like when, if that's sort of ominous and foreboding, this is like okay, it's more ominous. Like the bad guy is coming he's here like you're getting chased through the fucking haunted mansion like except it's not a fucking horror movie it's real life like getting chased by the fucking the man the government yeah with the knife the man with the knife yeah the government man with the knife yeah very very good i i i think we don't get songs like i was saying to them like songs like nothing by negative approach without something like this you definitely don't. And and it's interesting, again, how the threads overlap, because now I'm thinking about if these guys were maybe, and I haven't found any record of this, but if these guys were into something like the pop group or even a band like, it even reminds me, this song reminds me of the birthday party, because it's mm. just like this fucking driving, like, tribal rhythm, and then the same sort of unsettling riff the whole time. Like, I don't know. And I pretty feel repetitive like, yeah. lyrics, you know, especially near the end. Yes, it's just saying yes. D-Control, D-Control. We've been shit on too far too long. Well, maybe this song might have one of the best like vocal performances in a hardcore song. Like he is, he's it's emotional. It, it all. It's yeah. like angry and like, and it it seems to be like real. 
You know. Yeah, what I mean? this this is one of it ramps again, up. One of the few hardcore songs that it can make me feel like I'm going to choke up sometimes when I listen to it. Just the desperation in his voice, like just desperate for someone to hear, heed his warning, is uh, it, it's powerful. It can get me pretty emotional sometimes. Now, 1981, uh, in 1980, they're putting out records. They're playing around. Nothing super crazy, it seems, though. You know, 1981 is where it really pops off for Discharge. Well, yeah, and the new punk was popping off more by that point. This was, I believe, 81 was the year of... uh, Yeah, that was when Exploited Dead Cities came out. Army Life was 1980. Dead Cities came out in 81, and the Exploited uh, did their appearance on top of the Pops. Mm-hmm. Which it hilariously like they got on top of the pops because the record I think made it into like the top twenty or something yeah, for all records in the country. And then Discharge both all those singles yeah. had made pretty high up on the indie charts yes. too. Like pitting the top ten, I think, at least. Yeah. If it, not higher. Exploited got on the regular charts. I, they weren't as high as I just said. They were on there somewhere though. And hilariously, as soon as they did the top of the pops appearance, the sales plummeted because all their fans were mad that they went on top of the pops. Um, Hilarious. Perfect. It really says it all. But um, so, yeah, I mean, not 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 only, you know, with the exploited stupidity, like you have like the the fans as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Famously uh, brilliant fan base, the exploited. Some of the most brilliant minds that I've ever come across in my life. Yeah. So, so this this sort of new punk thing, or what, what what I would now call hardcore, and even in England back then they called it hardcore. Sometimes hardcore punk uh, is getting some attention in the mainstream music press in the UK, and also in the underground. These bands are starting to get a following. Uh, obviously, they had a following in the UK, but that is spreading to the US and elsewhere in Europe. Uh, US fanzines were covering these records a little bit. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, that impact yeah. is maybe starting to be felt, which is something that I've always been intrigued by, like uh, the extent to which, and it's hard to quantify or know, but I've researched it a little bit. Like, I think Discharge was an influence on early U.S. hardcore to a greater extent than they get credit for. Mm-hmm. I think everyone talks about, oh, they saw Bad Brains, saw Minor Threat, whatever, and that's all 100% true. But people in bands like Negative Approach, uh, SSD, Famously, there's some iconic photos of Springer with his homemade. I, it's a decontrol shirt. He just wrote "Discharge Decontrol" on a. I think that's what it was. He. I swear I saw him with one of those and one with a. Uh, or no, that's that. You know what? You know what it was. SSD got their name from the song "Decontrol." He had a homemade T-shirt. He's wearing in some photos where it says "Discharge Fight Back" in Sharpie. Oh, okay. What and, did he? Where, okay, that's. Oh, yeah, because it's... What is SSD stand for? Society, Society System, System Decontrol. Okay. So, clearly Discharge Sprite. Also, that first SSD record, Kids Will Have Their Say, and even the second one, big Discharge influence. In fact... Yeah, the, totally. The, the musical evolution on the, between those two records kind of mirrors Discharge musical ev- evolution in some mm. ways. Yeah, I can with hear the, that. With I, the guitar, mostly. Um, adding more lead guitar. So, I, I think this band around this time was starting to make an impact on... Uh, sort of early hardcore bands in the u.s sure. more so than they're credited for i mean this is when like the beginnings of the uk 82 like some of these bands are sent like you said verrucker's yep. forms in like 81 like i don't know too much about uk 82 but i do know obviously this is a band that like you probably kids probably saw and were like fuck this is insane i want to do this like and this starts what is going to be like, in my opinion, like 1980 is like the end of like the first wave of hardcore because like 1981, we're getting like what we call like hardcore, really call like hardcore. I mean, the first punk. Minor Threat record was 81, right? I think yes, it, so. Yes, it was. The Phil P was 81. So yeah. So this is the beginning. So the, elsewhere yeah. in Europe, the uh, anti Simex skin or excuse me, uh, Anarchist Attack. Record. I thought that was 82. No, I swear. Well, you can look it up. I swear Anarchist Attack's 81. Let me... I want to Is be it, sure. We're going to talk about bands influenced by Discharge. We're going to have to talk about Scandinavia, like, uh, at least a little bit. Anarchist, and they spell it um, like Scandinavians. Yep. Anarchist Attack. Yes, it says 1982. 
Really? I yeah. thought that was 81. Maybe they started No, in recorded in 81. It okay. was recorded that's in 81. That's what it was. Oh, that's why I thought it But it was out. like yeah. late 81. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, still, I'm sure they were probably listening to like Discharge they, they, by I, this time. I read an interview with, with one of them where they cited their main influences as like Chaos UK. There's another one started around this time. Yep. Discharge, Black Sabbath, and Chaotic Discord, that uh, joke band that was on Pusset's list. That is also disorder is, is I mean, very two, good. Yeah. Starts around eighty one. Yeah. yeah, chaotic disorder. Yeah, <laughs> but Don't why forget. the why EP? This is some might say the best discharge record. You know, some might. Some might. I wouldn't say. I think it's very good. I think my favorite discharge is the LP. Um, hear nothing, see nothing, say nothing. But I think why? If you said why, you know what? I'm not going to pull it against you. I. It is an incredibly. And it's an incredible record. I think it's a totally... I had that opinion for years. I think it's totally defensible. It is... uh, Hear Nothing, See Nothing is a little more polished. And I could... This is the most... I'll say this. This is the most, like, raw, like, abrasive, um, angry-sounding Discharge record, probably, in many ways. Um, At least as, as far as if we leave aside some of the singles, like, this record hits you like a fucking ton of bricks... Uh, and, and doesn't have some of the, like, I won't even say metal, but, you know, Hear Nothing, See Nothing has some things about it where I'm like, I can understand why metal guys would like this. Mm-hmm. Th- this record just sounds like... Hardcore? Un- uh, yeah, and, and it's unpleasant in a in a good way. I mean, those crash cymbals are just, like, deafening, and, and they're nonstop. I think this is also a notable change here. We have a lineup change. Tez leaves and uh bambi joins on drums yes yeah but i uh, would some sometimes these these lineup changes are pretty quick i believe tez stated that he had was able to play with the uk subs or yeah some yeah other band. he wanted to, he wanted to go on tour with the subs and so he was like i kind of you know i wanted to do that they were like cool all right i'm doing that like tez was very much a person that did a lot of stuff. He was like, yeah. on, always seems to be a guy that was always on to the next big he thing. He played with Ministry in the 90s. And, yeah, and dude. That, some of the stuff he said is crazy. It's like, yeah. what? What the Can't fuck? It. He like, was living with the guys from Naked Ray Gun and shit. That's so never, weird. Never would have never would have thought until I started researching for this. But you could tell it's a different drummer because you, it sounds... You know what? This explains what I was about to say about... Because I was about to say why, out of every record Discharge ever did... This sounds the most like a D beat record. Yeah, I would say so for sh- yeah. Like because modern this has D beat the... bands sound like like Disclosed, No Fucker, etc. Those bands sound like this record above all else. I, I mean, say. there's a one of the earlier Disclosed records is like straight up kind of rips off the beginning of Vision of War. Like with the, it starts off with I forgot which Disclosed record it is, but it starts with a boot boot boot. Like yeah, that's classic, you know, and and that makes sense because this is the first one where it is someone other than the inventor of the D beat or the progenitor of it playing the D beat. It is yeah. a guy trying to do what Tez was doing. Yeah, hundred percent. So and like we said, like with black metal, with all genres, you can't have a genre without other people copying you. Yeah, in a sense, it's like people have to rip you off. Sorry, like. So this is really interesting, and I think the biggest thing here is the production. It sounds really fucking booming. The drums on this sound fucking awesome. Yeah, like they. I think Discharge has always in these early '80s bands, these like this time had like really really good production. That's what like really set them apart from like other bands. Yeah, as do other Clay Records bands. I mean, when we went to do the uh, Leaking Head EP, I told. Uh, Sasha Stroud when I sent it to her to mix and master it I was it was the number one thing I told her I was like clay records think clay records yeah do we want to play a song off of this uh yeah we should sure what's what song any recommendations I mean visions of war is always good what's the second song again? does the system work yeah play, play that one that that's the one that sounds the most like modern DB to me okay sure Don't 
That's the end of part one of our Legacy of Discharge series. Originally, when we recorded this, it ended up being almost three hours long, so we wanted to break it up in two parts so it's easier to digest. So thanks for listening. Check out the episode next week for part two. And as always, you can visit kingsofpunk.com or on Instagram at coppodofficial, that's with a K, or on Twitter at kingsofpunkpod. Thanks for listening, and take it easy.